Hello everyone and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm a hands-on software architect and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson, we'll continue with part four of becoming a software architect in lesson 89, where we'll take a look at other aspects of this roadmap in detail about the journey to becoming a software architect. So in lesson 86, we saw how to kind of do, look at the checklist to make sure we're ready uh, to start the journey into becoming a software architect. Then in lesson, lesson 87, we saw how to develop a personal roadmap and radar. The last lesson, number 88, uh, we focused on how to gain and maintain that technical breadth and also industry knowledge. If you haven't seen any of those lessons, it would probably be a good idea to stop at this point, pause this video, and take a look at those other lessons. But in this lesson, we're going to take a look at the next step in this radar or this roadmap here, which is learning architecture styles and patterns. One of the things when kind of becoming a software architect is learning the language of architecture as well. And these architecture styles that we're going to be looking at here essentially allow a system uh, to be able to support some basic characteristics outside of, or what's usually called orthogonal to, the application functionality. For example, all of these illities right here, uh, we can talk in depth about any one of these. And the point is, we never once mention what kind of application we're talking about. And this is what architecture is really all about, uh, being able to support high levels of availability, testability, interoperability, uh, maybe learnability or portability, um, totally external from the application functionality. And as a matter of fact, these architecture styles really allow us uh, to do that by exhibiting these core characteristics. Some architecture styles support these kind of characteristics like performance and reliability and data integrity, and some do not. And so knowing these and learning these architecture styles and patterns is essential in becoming an effective software architect. Now, I'm gonna go over um, all eight of these, the most common ones very briefly here, but I really encourage you uh, to stay tuned and stay listening uh, towards the end of this video because I'm going to show very specific resources on how to gain more information about all these different architecture styles. Um, but the first one, of course, is the layered architecture. This is also called the de facto standard architecture. This is a very traditional architecture style, usually a monolith, uh, that we have been uh, developing for at least, I think, six decades already, where we basically separate things into layers, a very natural way of creating software. And this is what's called a technically partitioned architecture. Uh, this kind of fell out of favor uh, in recent years, especially the past decade, in favor of what's called the modular monolith. Uh, this is still a monolithic single deployment unit of uh, application, uh, but the modular monolith is what we call a domain partitioned architecture. In other words, rather than having our code separated by the layers of technical usage, uh, rather our code is organized into domains, and these are usually manifested through namespaces or package structures. A very popular monolithic architecture style, especially for domain-driven design. Uh, the other monolithic architecture style is one I'm very fond of, and that's the microkernel architecture, also known as the plug-in architecture style, where we do have a core system that may be both uh, layered or mono modular monolith, uh, but plug-in components um, that are either plugged in at runtime or uh, compile time. Uh, good examples of the microkernel are, in fact, things like uh, an IDE, uh, like IntelliJ IDEA or Eclipse or Visual Studio Code. Uh, any sort of uh, ticketing tool, like, for example, Jira or Rally is plug-in. Uh, PMD, Jenkins, a lot of the tools that we use as IT professionals are, in fact, the plug-in architecture. As a matter of fact, it could also be applications like tax software, for example, where the core system is the, the core tax, uh, like the 10, 1040 here in the United States, um, but the plug-in components are various worksheets and forms and stuff. So it's a very popular architecture style that provides a lot of great extensibility. 
However, on the distributed side, we of course have everybody's um, well-known uh, cool kid favorite architecture, microservices. Um, very unique in the sense that this is a highly distributed architecture style where we actually partition our system into separately deployed units of software almost at a function level where each service is single purpose, separately deployed and does one thing really well, all owning its own data. A very unique architecture style, very difficult uh, to implement. And then of course, we've got service-based, which is a hybrid of microservices. Service-based architecture is probably one of the most pragmatic architecture styles, uh, where we still have distributed services, but rather than being fine-grained microservices, in service-based architecture, each of these separately deployed units of software represent an entire domain, such as receiving or shipping or assessment, uh, these sort of large portions of the application, all sharing the same database. What used to be popular back around 2003 and also fell out of favor uh, was service-oriented architecture. Service-oriented architecture uh, really promoted reuse across our entire organization, uh, having core concepts such as policy or customer or issuer that, that basically spanned multiple divisions. Um, it was attempted. We learned a lot from that reuse that it really didn't work as well as we all thought it would. But that said, service-oriented architecture still has a place for system-wide integration, uh, integration of multiple heterogeneous systems across a division, uh, across divisions, or even across the entire enterprise. And that's really the sweet spot um, for SOA um, in today's world in 2020. Uh, two others, uh, event-driven architecture, which is very, very popular, especially in the past decade. It's increased significantly in popularity. Event-driven architecture is kind of interesting. I have and seen and I have also implemented pure event-driven architectures, but usually EDA, what's known as event-driven architecture, is usually um, melded in with other kinds of architecture styles to form hybrids, uh, such as event-driven microservices or event-driven space-based architecture or even event-driven microkernel. A very powerful architecture style uh, to increase responsiveness and performance and scalability. And finally, the last architecture style that I want to show you here is really space-based architecture, a very unique architecture style and that basically removes the database from the equation for transactional processing and relies solely on in-memory caching as part of the normal transactional processing of the system. Uh, this is the architecture style where you achieve the highest levels of elasticity and scalability and performance out of any given system. And so uh, these are eight core architecture styles. There are um, several others out there like pipeline or, or hexagonal architecture, but these ones really fit um, a majority of, I would say, 90% of all applications out there. And so let me show you a couple of places to go because right now we kind of finished this area of the roadmap here. I want to show you a couple of uh, specific resources for this lesson right here. And specifically, um, lots of books and videos. Um, uh, Neil and I just uh, recently in February of 2020 wrote The Fundamentals of Software Architecture where we devote an entire chapter uh, to go really deep into every single one of those architecture styles I just showed you. Um, I, I did write a, a book several years ago, Software Architecture Patterns, which kind of talks about, I believe it was five out of these, uh, a very uh, kind of summary level, but just to get an idea of the differences between all of these. Uh, we also, Neil and I have a video on Software Architecture Fundamentals Second Edition, uh, where we actually talk about all of these architecture styles as well. And so the video closely matches the fundamentals of Software Architecture book Although I will say we dive into so much more detail in the book than we do the video. And also segments from that video you can find in O'Reilly's learning path called the Software Architecture Fundamentals Architecture Styles, where we devote that specifically to talking about each of these architecture styles. Um, also, uh, I do have workshops and training that specifically are suited for learning more detail about these kind of architecture styles. Um, one workshop I really love is a virtual online three-hour class 
uh, called Choosing the Right Architecture. So I go over uh, when would you use each of these architecture styles? What are they good at? What are they bad at? And how do we choose the right one? And also um, uh, Software Architecture Fundamentals uh, two-day live virtual class that I usually do in uh, mostly for private training. Also, uh, Neil and uh, Ford and I have uh, started this free uh, Q&A forum called Foundations Friday Forum, where the last Friday of the month, we spend 30 minutes, it's totally free to sign up, uh, that we talk about some aspect of software architecture. As a matter of fact, at the date of this recording here, um, we are actually going to be talking about uh, the many faces of the microkernel architecture. So if you want to learn more about microkernel, um, please join us uh, in uh, the last Friday in June. And again, you can go to this website here uh, or this page on my website uh, to learn more about uh, this free resource and ask questions about uh, different architecture styles. And so this has been Lesson 89, Part 4 of Becoming a Software Architect. In the less, next lesson, number 90, which will be in one more week, by the way, as opposed to the two-week cadence, I'm doing these every week, um, please stay tuned where we'll be doing Part 5 on really understanding about trade-offs. It's the next step in kind of becoming a software architect is learning how to recognize and analyze trade-offs. And I'll talk about that piece in part five on lesson 90. So until then, stay safe, everyone. Thank you so much for listening and hope to um, uh, have you come back next week for lesson 90. Thank you all so much.